police and protests. And what have we seen over the last four, five, six, seven, eight years? A number of protests. So my expertise is actually in studying riots and studying protests and in studying police military tactics when it comes to protest policing. Uh, in addition to that, I have an engineering degree. Um, I started college at 11 years old, uh, started full time at 14. I graduated with. <laughs> oh, it's so funny because when I say stuff like that, people are like, you're lying, you're an alien. And I'd be like, I love to hear that, bro. And I, I actually forgot that you started college at what age again? I did not start as young as you, but I had a, I had a strangest curriculum. Look, dog, that's amazing. Please say that one more time for the people. Absolutely. I started college at 11 years old and I started full time at 14. So what what was crazy was I was trying to apply to get. Um, press on, press on. Press on, Don't you just love that? That just that just got me. Welcome back to another great episode of Trust Fund Baby Podcast. I have a reoccurring guest, whether it's been on Capital Games or whether it was uh, the NFT podcast that we did a while ago. <laughs> I wanted to say I always love building with bro. He is one of my favorite intellects to build with. I'm thankful to have him on the platform once again. Without further ado, please let's introduce Dr. Jamar Montgomery. DJ Bay, what's good, man? Peace, bro. What's going on? I seen you over there nodding to the end. I'm glad you like. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, bro. I gotta get me one. I gotta get me one. <laughs> yeah, bro. They took me probably. Oh my god, that was a fight just trying to get that with the right person. Shout out to um, Ro um, R O V hype, bro. Um, my man Dan, he made that for me, and he did a great job. He pieced together a lot of lecture content and stuff. And for anybody who don't know, that's my middle baby, my little man Prince on the audio. He and he in the back talk a trust fund baby. <laughs> no, but even yeah, bro. I'm about to say, um, one, thank you for coming on the pod. Like I asked you last minute, you had called me up when I was out of town, and I'm like, bro, come on the pod. I'm I'm shooting again for season two. And you was like, Yeah. So one, I appreciate that. And then yeah, like, you schedule quick. <laughs> so Please tell the people a little bit about what it is that you do, because I, you do so much and you from the people, you know, to what you got on your wrist right now, to the fields you work in. Like, please, just you you can do it, please. Most definitely, man. Well, first off, I, man, whenever you call, bro, I, I'm, I'm always going to answer because. Anytime that I call you, man, you always are lacing me up with game. Like, hey, bro, go do this or, you know, position yourself this way. So, man, uh, any anytime that I'm able to return the favor, man, it's always great. And always getting a chance to be able to build with you, man. So appreciate you uh, always. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Jamar Montgomery, a.k.a. Two Watch Doc of <laughs> Jay Montgomery Watches. And um, like brother DJ Bay said, I, I do a lot of things. Uh, once again, Dr. Jamar Montgomery, people ask me, well, you know, what kind of doctor did you get? I got a, I have a Juris doctor, which means that my degree is in law. And even though most people, when they become, when they get a JD, uh, they become lawyers, which I did, or they become attorneys, which I did, I treated my JD like a research degree. Mm. So I am a published expert in militarized police and protests. And what have we seen over the last four, five, six, seven, eight years, a number of protests. So my expertise is actually in studying riots and studying protests and in studying police military tactics when it comes to protest policing. Uh, in addition to that, I have an engineering degree. Um, I started college at 11 years old, uh, started full-time at 14. I graduated with... <laughs> Oh, it, it's so funny because when I say stuff like that, people are like, you're lying, you're an alien. And I'd be like, I love to hear that, bro. And I, I actually forgot that 
You started college at what age again? I did not start as young as you, but I had a, I had a strenuous curriculum. But dog, that's amazing. Please say that one more time for the people. Absolutely. I started college at 11 years old and I started full time at 14. So what, what was crazy was I was trying to apply to get um, another master's degree and they were like, oh, well, we need all your transcripts. And I'm like, okay, well, I have my transcripts from my undergrad. I have my transcripts from law school and I have my transcripts from my MBA. And they were like, oh no, we need all your transcripts. And I'm like, you want my transcripts from when I was in community college 20 some odd years ago? Are you serious? Right, I had to go back and look at like, dude, I got transcripts. I got, a, I got transcripts that are probably older than some of the people in our audience. So I have a question for you because there, if you may know, which may be difficult, how does somebody go about receiving their transcripts if their school may have been closed? Is that even possible? I have not seen where people have been able to get their transcripts, uh, particularly because of who's going to maintain those records if the school is closed, mm -hmm. uh, which is unfortunate. And oftentimes you'll have to write a letter explaining that, that, the, that, the, that the school has closed and that you no longer have access to those transcripts. That's good to know because yeah. they your damn sure closed my high school. I have no idea where I would get that transcript from. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that was a dual enrollment high school. They allowed us to get college credit. So, in high school, yeah. So you just imagine trying to prove that. Like I was in school, I was able to graduate one time with extra credits, and that put me in position. And now the school is just gone. You really don't. On a community level, and you as a politician, you can like appreciate this statement. You really don't know how those things affect you on a larger scale because yeah. now that could affect my political position, that could affect my employment, yeah. all because they tore school down that I graduated from years ago. They're not even thinking about it like that. They're yeah. we're mostly thinking about how it affects the children who can't go to the school in the neighborhood. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and that it's you bring up a, a very important point of the importance of documentation and having your records. And I didn't understand how important it was to keep documentation and keep all my records until it came time to start gathering all those records because now I'm going for security clearance. Now I'm going for a particular job. Now I'm trying to get into school and you're scrambling for these documents right or you find out that it might take you six weeks for them to get those documents to you and you call yourself being early in whatever application process so when we start talking about documents and start talking about your future the only way that you can really prove your past is through documentation can they take those memories from you no can they take that education from you no but they can act like it never happened <laughs> If no, ain't. that's real. That's crazy. You're you're completely right because it's um, in the Bible. It's a legal maxim, and it says if it's not on paper, it never happened. It so never happened. Paper, and you can't provide the paper. They can't provide. You can't provide evidence of it. And Absolutely. one thing I can tell people is, one thing I seen from my grandma. She was living when I was younger. She had um, an accordion bill folder, bro. You know the joints that click open and they just spread, and then it got all the files. Had all her stuff, documents listed A to Z. From me watching that lady from the time I was like in diapers, dude, because she would have me go get, she would put all her bills in there. She would write checks, everything. She would go get my um my bill phone and I'll go get it. And then she would show me where everything was at. I have two of those in my office right now. And I have a fireproof safe just because I do trust. I need to ensure that certain things in my family go to certain people. I have shares, paper shares for other things. I got hard drives all types of property and things that i want to be able to protect and you just never know i had a good friend who had a house fire one time so he ended up losing almost everything and you don't want to be in that position Hell, i lost my wallet one time it was oh my god i was in shambles do you understand the type of ids i carry it is so hard to get that stuff back yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um it's it can be very devastating very devastating and the part about it is 
if that has ever happened to you or you have your home burglarized, like I had my home burglarized, it is that act of letting go of like, oh man, like I'll never have that again. Yeah. That is that is that is truly a, a devastation and a loss that you recover from, but once it happens once, you do everything in your power not to have it happen again. So, you know, I remember as a kid and as a teenager looking through and be like, man, who would ever want a fireproof safe? Now as an adult, oh, I definitely understand. I definitely understand it. So having all your documentation and even certificates and awards, I have a partner who has a folder full of 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 uh, laminated sheets of certificates and things like that, his entire history. And I was like, that's a smart idea. So not only the documents that you need for your government, but also the documents that are important to you. No. And even when we started talking about, you know, like family documents, transgenerational wealth, you know, we talk about assets. My Rolex is somewhere around here. And then I got, I'm not wearing my big chain, but that's somewhere. I got other jewelry that I, I've just acquired over time. I had jewelry that was passed, like my rings that were passed down to me from my grandfather. So these are like family heirlooms and assets that have an intrinsic value and also an, um, a monetary value that can be appraised. So when we start talking about what you're doing right now, when it comes to the watch company, exactly. We know, well, I know watches are assets. And then like the crazy, this is one of my favorite watches right here. And this is a, um, this is a Garmin. So this is all I'm talking about that damn garment because I love this watch has this same watch has done me right for almost five years. Got Phoenix glass, this same glass that be on the Rolly. I'm I can put whatever brand and logos I want. Like I got my grandma. For how can you? How can you express the importance of what it is that you're doing to people? What happened to that? That's a that's a great question. And oh your your um your video just went out. I got you. I know what happened. So did you want me to continue or did you want me yeah, to go ahead? Go ahead. You good, bro. Uh, the that's a great question because you know I like the I like the Rolex styling. I like I like that. It's on here right now. And it's just it's like the perfect work watch. I be in the air, I can track myself, I can track my breathing, my heart rate, all the little crazy little tech stuff. But as a man and a man who works, you learn to appreciate a good watch. And then you start seeing these companies and then even Rolex. A lot of people don't know. Rolex is a trust. Yep. They're a trust. So that leads me to my question. What do you see for your watch brand and how do you plan on asserting yourself? And like, how can you... How can you express the importance of what it is that you're doing to people? That's a great question because, you know, I like the I like the Rolex styling. I like I like that. Right. Let's get you. Let's everybody get a look at that. Let's just see if we can do it like that. Get in the camera. Oh, it's upside down. Well, let me take this bad boy off. Let me do it like that. Right. I like the Rolex styling, but you're not going to get a Rolex that that has an airplane, an F-22 at the 12 at the 12 o'clock indices. You're not going to get that. You're not going to get those kinds of, of combinations. But the reason why I like this style is because the style is instantly recognizable. And when I walk into a room, when, when I walk into a room with my watches, people will be like, oh, that's a that's a nice Rolex. And I instantly correct them. I said, no, this is a, this is my own brand. It's the J Montgomery. And I'm like, oh, it looks like a Rolex. I said, I know, I know, but I built these. I built these by hand. So I sourced the movements. Uh, we use Japanese movements and we also use Swiss movements in our watches. So our watches are built on quality movements to begin with, and we utilize quality components. But the thing that I express to people is that because this is a classic and well-known style, my brand represents people who have achieved conventional success in unconventional manners. Mm. So you'll find yourself in these rooms with powerful and wealthy people but the way that you got there wasn't the same way that they got there but you're still in those rooms what do i mean by that uh unconventional success conventional success in unconventional manners uh back in last year in june of 2023 
I was at President Biden's press conference during the G7 in Hiroshima, Japan. Right? Wearing this watch. Now, did the watch get me in the room? No, I got myself in the room. But what the, the watch shows is the watch is a status symbol. When people, when people are looking at you, they're looking at the way in which you carry yourself. They're looking at the way that you dress. They're looking at the accessories that you have. And now they're making judgments based upon who you are. Now, none of those things, none of those things make who you are, but we live in a world where people are making judgments based off of what they see. So as you, as I have made myself, as I have entered into these kinds of rooms of the G7, and I'm there with President Biden while they're talking about uh, nuclear, uh, uh, not nuclear war, but preventing nuclear war. When I'm at the World Economic Forum giving speeches on the integration of AI and blockchain, right? I'm with the world's wealthiest and most powerful people, and I have the accessories I have the, not only the pedigree, but the accessories that show that I'm supposed to be there. So for people like myself who have been in situations where, look, um, I didn't go, I didn't, I didn't go to the Harvards, I didn't go to the MITs, but I have the pedigree of being at a Harvard or being at. You a have Harvard. a whole engineering degree, right? I have a whole engineering degree. I have not only do I have an engineering degree, I have a a a a, a law degree. I have a uh, uh, a MBA, right? So my engineering degree, my engineering degree has brought me into certain places. It brought me into the areas of of government and in defense. And funny thing about it is the system that's currently shooting down drones in the Red Sea was my system. Mm. Right, that was my system. I'm uh, also just it, I know it looked like it, but this night this is the homie hat, Rich and because yeah, I Rich keep and yeah, this is my man's finesse stuff because I do got the other one, but I know that you didn't been around both of the well, the previous political party. Oh man, Joe, he he dropped out, but I know that you you just said that you you have been around Joe Biden, and I know that you personally have went to go um have dinner with um Donnie down yes. here in florida and it was you yay nick fluentes and kanye and i remember you, when you told me the story donald was saying some choice words about kanye ex-wife at the time absolutely absolutely <laughs> but how, what are you if you don't mind it doesn't have to necessarily be political but we can't talk about it and because that's the beauty of understanding politics because you can express why you may align with a specific side, because I know you personally know their political background, also the policies that they are for, the ones that they are against, and also the work that they have actually done versus what the media is saying. So can I please get a little bit of insight on what you think about the current political climate as far as the federal level? From the federal level, I I think that, well, not, let me rephrase that. From the federal level, um, People are focused on identity politics instead of voting for their own interests. What do I mean by that? People are going with people that they can identify just identify with just from a visual level. Oh, this person is a woman. I'm voting for her. Oh, this person is black. I'm voting for them for that reason. Oh, this person is white. I'm voting for this person for that reason, which is the absolute worst way to vote. Mm -hmm. The best way to vote is to understand what your interests are. And what are your interests? Your interests are anything and everything that you are willing to protect, anything and everything that you're willing to fight for, anything and everything that you are willing to die for. I enjoy my freedom. I know that other people are solely responsible for taking that away with the implementing in the street, the three strikes rules and mass incarceration. And people just, they don't look into where people align with or what financially aligns their pockets. One thing people don't know, there are politicians are very well paid and it's not from sitting in that political seat. When you push policy, you figure out what bills and what companies you can align yourself with and invest into, whether if that's in the stock market or if it's privately. Am I right or am I wrong? 
You're you're absolutely right. In fact, uh, you already know what's coming down the pipe because the companies have approached you directly or indirectly through their lobby or their lobbyist or an entire industry has approached you through their lobby or uh, an ent- uh, a wealthy individual or a wealthy corporation has reached out to you indirectly through a PAC, uh, what is known as a political action committee. So there are way in America, we have figured out a way of legalizing corruption, but we've created it in a system that is organized and has rules so that even though it is corruption, that there are rules that need to be followed in the ways in which we influence and control our politicians. Let me let me break that down for 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 our audience. The two things that a politician needs is money and votes. Those are two things that they need in order to get elected. They need money and votes. But long before it's time for you to vote for them, they needed money. And this is the the choice that politicians are put into. I got two people yelling at me, telling me what it is that they need, what it is that I should do. But only one of them is putting money in my pocket or making donations to my campaign. Mm -hmm. or making donations to my political action committee which person do you think i'm going to listen to first the one who um financially incentivized you by funding your campaign that's the way it usually works and that's one of the main reasons that melanated people have an issue but this time these people have raised millions for this melanated lady overnight so it's not like they can't do it it's not I, even do it. I'm going to push back. The the challenge that they that that's going on right now is that literally the money that was in uh President Joe Biden's campaign account, uh they're switch they switched the names on the particular account. That's the issue, that's the challenge that's being put forth right now with the Federal Elections Committee. How dare they? I'm pretty that's, sure that, that is unethical. So when you see that she that, gets, that's almost like money laundering, bro, because you're lying on books. So when you see that she raised $81 million, that is what that's why the Trump campaign and others are launching this complaint with the Federal Elections Committee. Now, to to your point about the donations that she has made within the that have been made to her, there was a call of 144,000 white women the other night and they raised two million dollars. Black men, 44,000 black men got on the phone and raised about two million dollars. Uh, another 44,000 black women got on 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 a call and raised another, you know, one uh, one and a half, two million dollars. So, yes, Kamala Harris is is currently raising money. The challenge is, is for us as melanated. What, people. what happened to all this money when they lose, bro? They, they don't stay, give it back. No, they don't give it back. It stays in the so a politician's job, first job and second job is to get reelected. Okay, so what happens if you get all this money and you don't even get elected the first time? Because let's just be real. Let's just be super, super real about the world we live in. One, we live in a misogynistic society where we idolize almost every deity as a man. So we look at power as a man. We have a male-ran military operation. The majority of the electoral college is males as well. And the majority of them are not people of melanin. And there is a stigma, which I am very comfortable saying because I come from a melanated household, on melanated women that they are angry and that they are loud and mean and no man will, no alpha man will put a woman like that that they believe in their mind in a position of authority over them. And that is the majority of the United States nation. So just being realistic about the reality and the climate of the situation, there's a, this is not even a real chance she's going to win. So where is money going to go? That's, that's a great question. That's that's a great question. And that has been something that I've been discussing about uh, I, Kamala Harris's uh, chances for winning, right? Her chances for winning. I believe that she's being set up for failure right now by the Democratic Party. But that's a discussion for another time. What happens to the money is the money sits in their campaign account. And people are like, well, 
aren't you supposed to use that money? No, that's the, the that money gets saved up for the next election, or so that money gets loaned her out. Next election, her next election or the Democratic Party election? Her next election. Now, so what she, she's in charge. Uh, she's in, in the candidate. It, so there's 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 a couple of accounts, and I want to help people understand. You have your own individual campaign account. Then you'll have a PAC account. And with your PAC account, you can have somebody else in charge of that doing things for the particular campaign. Then outside of that, you ha you'll have a super PAC that supports you but cannot directly coordinate with, the with your campaign. I was just thinking about it because I was going to ask you, do how does it work? And you're doing it right now because you're explaining it in detail how, but this may not be the section that you want to break down, but I appreciate it because I was unaware. That's why I'm asking questions because I genuinely want to know, like, if they didn't get this woman $82 million when we're technically in a god darn recession, <laughs> and we just know the United States dollar has been went, went from number two to number three to almost 10 right now. And these people just rallied up all of this money for this circus campaign, really much for this TV show, because they're going to choose who they want to choose based on the electoral college. And all of these people know who they already are aligned with. And the government is going to choose who it wants to choose right at the end of the day, period. That's just what happens, regardless of how people feel. So I'm like, this is a hustle. And like, I understand why Nancy Pelosi got so much damn bread. Like that lady's far from broke. I just seen some of the companies she's invested net, in. What's her net worth? Like 200 million? It's just crazy, bro. These people don't got a tech company or nothing. All they do is flip bread based on the exactly. stuff that come across their desk. Exactly. But I knew um, earlier when we were talking about the watches and you were talking about how people are just associated with um, different likenesses of cultic personalities and how we have been conditioned to um, resonate with certain family names and brands. Yep. Are you familiar with the video, um, How to Sell to a Negro? Yes, I am. Yes, um, some people may not be. So I just wanna show a very small snippet of this video just to enlighten people on why your mindset may be the way it is and why you believe you may need Burberry, Gucci, and Louis Vuitton instead of just going to Burlington or grabbing some $5 t-shirts and then you just put together an outfit for like $20, $30 and you kill it. For some reason, you believe you must only have these things or your understanding of quality is different, differentiated based on a dollar sign versus material. So let's just tap into this. All right, where we at with it? This is what sales psychologists have to say about selling to the Negro. The secret of selling to the Negro is expressed in one word. That word is recognition. Now, there's nothing unusual about that. People want to be recognized. They need recognition. That's basic in all of us. But perhaps because he's had so little of it, the Negro needs even more. He needs to feel important and appreciated. This need is a very real and important one. It shows up even in many of the Negro's shopping habits. Anyone who sells or wants to sell to the Negro customer should know about some of these habits. Yeah. Three habits in particular play a big part in every sales transaction. To begin with, most Negroes buy by brand. They ask for products by name. They're quick to turn down off brands. <laughs> buying by brand, that's the first important Negro buying habit. Now for the second. The Negro buys good quality merchandise. Symbols of quality and prestige are very important to the Negro customer. This woman, for example, is buying fine crystalware. But she is also buying the admiration and approval of her friends and relatives. Listen to her thoughts. My, isn't it beautiful? I can hardly I wait to show the talent and It's a well-known fact that many Negro customers are influenced by the opinions of others. Mm. What their friends may think of a certain item often decides whether or not the sale is made. So remember, the Negro buys quality merchandise. That's the second important point. And here's the third thing to remember when selling to a Negro customer. When he specifically asks for one thing, don't try to sell him something else. Don't try to switch him at the point of sale. If you do, 
he'll probably react something like this. Doesn't he think I've got the money to pay for it? The Negro resents being offered a substitute. He wants to be sold on quality, not price. The Negro buys by brand, he buys quality, and he doesn't like to be switched at point of sale. These are the keys to selling the Negro customer. Hmm. Did they lie? How old is that? How old is that? That's Did you hear? That's got to be at least from the 50s, the, 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 the 50s. And the reason why you could tell it's from the 50s is because of the radio voice that they utilize, right? The, the voice, the voice changed from the 40s to the 50s. So from the 50s, which makes that 70 years old. And they still are like that. Still like that. I literally argue. I don't argue with nobody. We have disagreements because we're adults. It's just like, it's a disagreement of mindset, but it's also based on what lifestyles we live because I have business partners who are heavily engulfed into the music industry. So they're taught flash brand. This is what attracts more people. But I'm like, I have millionaire homies and I also know some billionaires. I'm like, these motherfuckers walk around jeans and golf Nikes, bro. And they have 60K in their pocket and they drive a Toyota. And they're fine. Like, I love my Volkswagen. I get, like, what, I get, like, 40 miles a gallon thing, fill up on, like, $35, bro. I'm, and when I had my Benz, it was, like, 160 to fill that thing up. I'm like, why would I overextend myself to make you people happy who don't even know my last name? I'm like, you just see me be like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I'm like, F these people, bro. <laughs> Well, it, you bring up a, a great point because it's there. It it's great to buy quality, right? It's great to buy quality when it serves a purpose. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why I buy a Toyota because there's the quality that's associated with the Toyota. There's a reason why I buy a, a Benz because of the quality associated with with the with the bins however i buy those specific things for a purpose mm -hmm. and it's the purpose that always gets us in trouble if the purpose is to show off for someone else right instead of your own personal enjoyment well what happens when people are no longer impressed by what you have by what you drive you're still responsible for that car payment Mm -hmm. You're still responsible for that insurance. You're still responsible for that gas. And the enjoyment that you got from it is no longer there because what you bought it for was for the specific purpose of impressing others. There's nothing wrong with having nice things, but there is some that there, there, there is a price to pay for having those nice things. And you have to decide as an individual, is it worth that price? You're thinking, they, go ahead, go ahead. You no, think was, you think that you're buying you think that you're buying a Benz, but what you're really buying is validation from others, mm -hmm. and that's the decision that you have to. That's what you have to be honest with yourself about. Why why am I getting this? Why why am I getting this? Am I getting this because I want to I I, I want to show that I made it, or do I want to get this because this is what I really actually enjoy and what I and, and what I like. Same reason why people buy Rolexes, bro. Validation, levels of approval. These are, um, it's so crazy because even this piercing, like everything has some form of meaning. Like the conch piercing, people get them in order to show like a, a level, a spiritual awakening or a leveling up. And some people feel like that's what a Rolex is in business. But who made that standard? Was it us? But why did we accept that standard? So my question to you is, how do we, or what patterns have we seen in history, like FUBU and stuff, how do we bring that level of energy back into melanated brands to where these names can be long lasting? Because even still, I may, I may just be overlooking some. I don't know too many melanated luxury clothing brands that are at least 30, 50 years old. I'm pretty sure it is some. I just may not have them in my closet. Hell, Dapper Dan been doing good for years, but he usually chopping up other people's brands and piecing it together. 
Yeah. Yeah. That it's it's definitely a it's definitely a challenge because the the longevity requires scale. And that's one of the challenges that you have. Another challenge that that you have is the we don't have any conglomerates. What do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. Um LVMH, which stands for Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, right, mm -hmm. is a group that's owned by Bernard Arnault. Okay. Louis Vuitton Moet and Hennessy, it, the moment that that Louis Vuitton is no longer it is no longer interesting, guess what? Guess what still is selling? Moet. Guess what still is selling? Hennessy. So this is a conglomerate full of luxury brands that our people, our people have associated a certain level of quality, but not just quality, a certain level of status. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, not I think, one of the challenges that we have is that our rappers and our entertainers are always in our face and our rappers and our entertainers are flawed individuals who have now been given the spotlight. So our rappers and our entertainers represent in some ways uh, the worst of us. Uh, if, and if not the worst of us, it re they represent the flawed parts of us that are now on, on, on display, which is why they are so popular because people are able to identify with, it, with them. Now, so, now. I, I, just in, real in that, quick. Remember, the, remember the NFT round. I mean, the NFT phase and stuff. And like when we were talking, when we were just talking about this, you'd be like, "Is it the artist who's responsible, or is the the company who is sponsoring it who's paying them?" Because when you know, like rappers really don't make that much money, bro. They gotta go on tour and run shows. So if somebody be like, "I cut you fifty k," you know, or like a hundred, you six nice six figure check just for you to be on video rick ross said every time he hold a bear or bottle or he do an ig video that's almost 50k for him bro so you just think about it it's like it reminds me of the nft stuff when bore apes had where well, was having people do non-disclosure agreements through moon pay and stuff and then they have them promoting it even though none of these people were actually about the brand did rolex do that to us remember jacob the jeweler who went to jacob first who even found jacob because Jacob's heavily invested in our culture, even still to this day, even after the prison bid. And you know, like, since we talk about watches, like, Jacob was that guy at one point in time. His shit still be looking fire. Jacob, the jeweler, became big because of the rappers. Exactly. Like, who was the rapper who found Jacob first? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. And <laughs> it's crazy because... You know, when I was in at, in Dubai for Dubai Watch Week and I got to display my watches, uh, not too many people were stopping by Jacob the Jeweler's uh, 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 display. Now, does he make the, the some of the stuff that he makes is I would it's high quality, right? It's, it's high quality. But in the realm of 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 business and in the realms of of horology. I haven't seen too many people who are wearing Jacob the Jeweler watches, but you know who is wearing it? Right. Rappers and entertainers. Because they don't really know. If you like a, an individual who I believe has a crazy watch collection, just because of how much he talks about it, is um, Mr. Wonderful. Like, he is so into watches, bro. It's crazy. And you just, when you understand when a man like that, he... For him, it's almost like a hobby, but it's a hobby that has financial benefits because you can just go sell a watch and make more than what you bought it for any day on any day. You just, it's always somebody looking to buy a watch, bro. It's crazy. Yep. It's a really good market to be in. It it's a it's a great market to be in. It's also a challenging market to be in because to make quality, there's a a lot of costs involved mm -hmm. in it. And you you might you might like, well, why is it? Why is this particular watch like I I took a a JJ Lecoult I took JJ Lecoult's um, inaugural watch making introduction class mm -hmm. in New York at their boutique. 
And when you take apart one of those watches, you see the amount of machining and attention to detail that is put in every single piece. It's like a little computer. It is lit. The, the watches were considered the computers of their time. They were at when they when they were developing them a uh, hundred and hundred and fifty years ago. Watches were some of the most complex pieces of machinery because of how small that they were and the amount of tolerances that were there. Right. So when you buy a watch, you're buying the story. You're buying the quality. You're buying the journey. And now you as a person for whatever whatever story, whatever part of your journey has brought you and this watch in the same place at the same time, you're now able to commemorate that. And that's what's important about Jay Montgomery watches. That's not like a crazy pitch, bro. That's almost like the hallmark of watches because I know one thing, because even me and Parker, we have spoke about it before because he wanted to get his own watch. I'm like, I I'm I do so much math. I talk myself out of the situation so quick, bro. I'd be like, the overhead is too much. Hell no. Nah. <laughs> like, uh -uh. But you just when if you can if I can tap in with your brand, not necessarily I'm just saying like if I could buy into somebody else's brand and I feel like this is mine, this caters to my family legacy, mm -hmm. and then you know, like that's an asset. When watches become heirlooms, you know, with engravings and you know, like family, certain family things on it. Oh, if a watch company like y'all, if y'all were able to do something like that, I would buy watches all the time because, but customization of watches gets expensive because those aren't things that you can just have done in like wholesale, bro. You right. like you, yeah, that should get pricey. I want to I want to show your I want to show our audience I want to show your uh, our audience that this isn't something this is a labor of love yeah, and the reason why it's so important is because this is a watch that I'm doing for for a client right now oh uh, it's rose gold with a with a blue face right with a blue face and hold on let me show this bring this out to you our watches include. Was that uh, baguettes? Then was baguettes? What uh, was that? What was, what was that inside? What no, was going those, on? those weren't baguettes. Those, those are just uh uh. Okay, I can still. Uh, that's still. Ooh, that's that's your signature in the middle. That's my signature in the middle. I look clean, right? So this is that what what we're doing is we also are utilizing leather bands, but inside of our leather bands, your watch acts like your business card. So you could tap this to your phone and you will be able to, to give them your information. We're adding technology. You got, NF you got NFC bands? Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Up, so, you know, I, I want people to understand. I want people to understand. I'm looking for one of the movements. This isn't something. Bro, but that is gets even more crazy on the tech side because through an NFC, if it, through an NFC tag, that can also become a, le a level of like almost NFT authentication. Be like, this is certification that this you know, is that. All of that, crazy. all of that is there, man. You you know anything I do is going to involve blockchain. So I want people to understand that this is something. This is the this is the movement, right? This isn't this isn't court movement. This is this is literal physical movements, right? So these watches that I have, the J Montgomery watches are watches that are hand built, right? Hand assembled, assembled with love. It takes my time, it takes my energy, it takes my expertise and my journey. And I'm now sharing that with someone else, right? These watches, this watch right here was with me at the G7. This watch here was with me in Davos, Switzerland, right? I want people to understand that there's it's not just buying a watch what you're doing is you're buying a legacy you're buying a journey and you're investing in your journey because every time that you wear a j montgomery watch you're going to think about the important times in your life and you had that watch on and the recognition that you got yeah that i'm glad you said that here because I hope this clip get chopped up and live forever. And then they be like, <laughs> end up becoming a movie because it's different. Like you ever seen the Gucci movie or the Lamborghini movie? I watch a lot of movies about family wealth. And yeah. then you just see, you understand when you're building something, 
what your what your backstory is going to look like because when you're working and you be like just think about it like if you write a biography for yourself like stuff like this these moments you in expressing this level of know-how these are these are important steps like these are press releases and this is when the world gets to know what it is that you're providing to them so that they can opt into it and like people just don't understand like how important these steps are <laughs> they're stepping stones to greatness but it's just like bro i applaud you because one thing i know for sure is making a watch a single watch is not even like it's not an easy task and you've been able to make a company and also make different designs and provide them to other people so i for sure would be patronizing you i already know the colors i want i know the face i'm like you just got to send me an invoice bro we good to go this is the <laughs> this this is the first one. Ooh, oh yeah hold on wait, wait stay right there let me move Yeah, man. Rose gold with the rose gold signature with uh black face with rose gold accents, bruh. With the I, stones I'm, in the middle. Yeah. I'm going to pay you for a collaboration watch. I need a little trust fund babies in there for the, for my children. Let me know. Let me I'm know. Dead. I'm so serious. <laughs> like I said, our, our, our watches, uh, Jay Montgomery watches are our custom watches, are our, our, our custom watches. And so when you get a, a Jay Montgomery watch, you're getting quality. You're getting something that is hand built, that is made with love, that is made with time, that is made with expertise. So it's it's uh, it, it has been a journey and it's been a recognition of my own journey. No, bro, it's, I appreciate anybody doing anything that is building, like, industry and legacy. We have, and then, like, with the proper structure, bro, you can build out shell stuff to be better than what a Rolex is. Because there's nothing that guarantees that Rolex will be around in the next 100 years. There is going to be other watches and other technology that replaces these brands. Like, Nipsey Hussle said it best. He was like, this is like the gold rush. It's, co it's corporations crumbling and crumbling. And then there's going to be new industries popping up overnight. We're those new industries. We just have to build the industry so that they can take over the old ones. Yep. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And I'm thankful to know all of the people and the families that are going to be those future families. You, you ever seen um, Jay-Z? Um, I think it was the Family Feud video. Yeah. With Amari Hardwick and stuff, and how these families were in the dystopian future, these were the melanated people who was running the future, bro. And that's because, and they were talking about their forefathers. That would be us. And we built the legacy for them to be the ones to do these things in this time frame. And that's how I look at my future. And I'm pretty sure you do the same, or otherwise, we wouldn't even be thinking about the next generations. Yeah. Now, with that being said, because I just may get a little lengthy. Let's segue into our how does it work segment. So Perfect. I asked you to come on the show and explain some things. And you were like, you, you you glanced over a few things very quickly. But you said that you all, you have an engineering degree. You have worked in politics and you actively are politics. Oh, you ran for you ran for U.S. Senate in the 2020 in the state of Louisiana, correct? Yes. Yes. I didn't want to say the wrong position, but I remember the state. You ran for Senate, which is hot. That's that's high up there. And then also other positions for engineering. And then you are the CEO and founder of a luxury watch company, which I think is super dope, bro. So out of all of these things, what specific field can you break down on how does it work so that somebody can learn? How to better their life in a specific way and increase cash flow or either make some dynamic changes within their community bro. absolutely uh well for cash flow i help people understand cryptocurrency and blockchain mm -hmm. uh when i was at the for those that may not know this uh the world economic forum is basically where all the world's richest people come in in davos switzerland it's in january it's in january and it's usually right around the time of my birthday and the world's richest people come there 
uh, and discuss what their countries are doing and what their plan is for the future. Uh, I gave a speech and I was on a panel for Hedera, uh, Hedera Hashgraph, which is a blockchain blockchain company. Uh, and I gave a speech. You, you spoke for Hedera? I don't mean to interrupt you, but bro, that's crazy. yeah. I was I was on the I was I was on a panel with the co-founder uh, of Hedera, Dr. Lehman Beard. There's there's pictures of me uh, speaking with him. Um, in fact, I had a, a like a two hour conversation with uh, uh, Dr. Beard. Uh, me and him were, were 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 chopping it up the day before the panel, and then I was on the panel talking about the integration of blockchain and AI. And that's that was my second year. This is my second year of going to Davos. Last year I was talking about blockchain and politics. So the the if you want to understand blockchain and you want to understand cryptocurrency and how to invest and what it all what it all means, I'm able to break that down. I've been in the space since 2016. I've been a builder in the space since 2016. Uh people will, you know, people say, Oh, I've been in blockchain this this long. Check the check their wallet address. Right? <laughs> check their wallet address. See when they got their ENS name, right? See, see, see about that. See when they got their ENS name. Um, I've been in the space since 2016. You can check and you'll see transactions on my wallet back in 2017 where we created a coin called Amy, right? Been in the space. Um if you want to understand law and understand what the law says, I don't give legal advice because I'm not a practicing attorney at the moment. Um, but I can tell you what the law says. I can tell you uh, what certain terms mean and what certain certain legal regimes mean. Uh, if you want to learn about that, and, and you know, we connected over the trust stuff, mm -hmm. right? We we connected over over how trusts work and and how to structure things and how to protect your assets and how to stay out of probate court and things like that. I'm able to break those things down. And one of the things that I'm passionate about is also politics. So if you want to understand how do you make change in your government? How do you make your government work for you? How do you get a return on an investment of your tax dollars? Something that you don't have any choices in paying depending upon what, what legal regime that you're operating under. <laughs> Right. I have to I have to say that whenever whenever I'm on a podcast with you. Uh and I, 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 I'm an old Indian. It's saying the constitution India is not tax, bro. I, like I like I like I said, under whichever legal regime in which you operate under, <laughs> right? Uh you know, I'm able to break those things down and particularly in so um, out of out of that, can because when you started to break down Davos and you mentioned it a few times, I know a lot of people are not familiar with the World Economic Forum. Can you kind of give us a framework of what um, the World Economic Forum is and how it could be used or the benefit of it, or even like how you may get to the World Economic Forum? Because it's not something that just anybody goes to, bro. Uh, I'm saying this jokingly and half seriously. It's uh, uh, the party for the Illuminati. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> I say that. That's so I, funny. That's so funny. I say that. I I say that half jokingly and I say that half seriously. Um. Yeah. Um. I'm not going to say too much. I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to say too much. But I will. What I will say is that um, presidents, pr presidents and heads of states go there. The leaders of the largest companies uh, in the world go there. Uh, so you'll see the CEO of Google. You'll see the CEO of Palantir. You will see the Prince of Monaco. Um, I had conversation. You know, the Kerry uh, Kennedy came to see me speak. Hmm. Right. The the uh the the some family names um <laughs> that you will know that 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 you will know. Um I get contacted by them. Let's just say it like that. Um yeah. Yeah, it, it's yeah, you know, I might say you work with quadrillions and stuff too, and he didn't I didn't see some of the family TV around. <laughs> So you know what I mean? Like there's it's um 
I I I feel like I feel like I come back, I, I come back, I go to the Illuminati and I see what they got going on and I bring it back to my people about, hey, this is what we need to prepare for. That's another um, show y'all should watch, our little YouTube videos, um, Spook Who Sat By The Door. Oh man, that's a great movie. It's a great and movie, an even greater book, Sam Greenlee. It's, it's necessary. It's ne so what is the purpose of the World Economic Forum? World That's purpose of the world the party. I, I once again I say that jokingly. I say I that know, no, 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 and no. I, and I say it half seriously. I I say it. So let me okay, just say who that. don't enjoy a good Illuminati party? You know, bro. You know, like in light. Uh, you know, you know how it goes. <laughs> I just, you know, I'm a I'm a man that 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 believes Jesus Christ is Lord. So I don't want anybody thinking that I still. <laughs> Or anything like that. I plead the blood of Jesus. I, I, I plead the blood of Jesus and Jesus is king. So uh, I don't want anybody thinking that I sold my soul. Uh, to go to Davos. <laughs> yeah, to go to Davos, right? Uh, but what I will say is that the World Economic Forum is where all the world leaders come together and set the agenda for that year or report and report on what went well, what went bad. Uh, in the previous year is where the it's the one place think of it as a, as as a conference for the world's most powerful people. Uh, these people are busy, but they know to show up for this conference. It's like showing up to the Bitcoin conference and you're in Bitcoin, right? You're things that you're that you're connecting and networking with people that you need to network and you need to know. So given the circles that I run in and the people that call me for my advisement, that call me for my expertise, uh, it's a place that I get invited and I get sponsored to go to. So um, I was sponsored this past year and I was sponsored last year to go to Davos. So It's crazy because when I understand what that climate is like, and it's unfortunate that a lot of our people don't have um, corporate backgrounds on that level. Let me, to, to let, me put, let me put you on game. Uh, you, the the funny part is is uh, um, I ran into E Y E Y L out there. Oh yeah, I remember that. But yeah. they have they're a different breed of situation. They blew up in the financial climate, so it would, and they also operate almost like a high end melanated media platform. So it would behoove them to understand what's going on. And you can also see the way that they're posturing themselves for the future. They're looking more like a media conglomerate instead of just like a podcast based on the way that they're kind of building out. And you, your main job is to have financial know-how. So where's the main place you need to have your ass at? It's Davos, bro, at the World Economic Forum. It's, it's, the, 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 the difference was is that they were there as spectators. I was there as a speaker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, see, like I love that because the crazy thing is they desire to be in your position, but because of your background and what it is you've been able to do, your your social media following may be much smaller than theirs. No disrespect, but your financial outreach is crushing theirs because of what it is you've been able to do throughout the years. And people have to understand this internet shit isn't always what you think it is. It isn't. It, it it really isn't. And it's like I said, the the fact of um I get called for my expertise. I don't get called because of my face. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And that's no Yo, you have an actual body of work. And that's what we ask, like that's what me and my peers we ask about people. I'm like, I don't care about who these people may be on the internet or whatever. I'm like, what's your body of work? Have you written any books? Have you done anything? How many people have you actually helped? Or are you just somebody who sell a course, bro? Like yeah. there are all these other influencers. And then I had I said this on Finesse Podcast. I'm like, are you gonna is, is your course gonna outlive you? In most cases, it won't. <laughs> That's yeah. not longevity, bro. Yeah. Yeah. And just like understanding, I appreciate like you, my other homie Jay, like very corporate-minded individuals, because 
you being in Davos or at the World Economic Forum, it reminds me of certain episodes of Billions and Successions when they go on to these large corporate retreats overseas. And then this is where the real businesses meet, business meetings are happening. It's not necessarily at the forum. It's at the private meetings outside yep. of the forum when people yep. understand I can have a face to face with this individual. So this is the highest level of networking that's happening every year. And yeah. that's why you say what you say you is, because these are the people who have the financial ability to literally move a mountain. Yep. And they're coming together conversing. So yep. like that's like who doesn't want to be around that just because you know it's beneficial just being in those rooms. Yep. It is. And it's even more beneficial when you have something to offer. Thanks. So yeah. what is it that you can offer in a room like that? Is it because if you're not the most financially set person, what is the next thing? Intellect? Access. 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 There are other markets that they may not necessarily be able to access, but I have access to it. Mm. Uh, there are certain perspectives that they don't have that I have. Uh, there are certain levels of maneuverability that I have that they may not necessarily have. And the depth and breadth of my experience is you you have a I can pull your entire team together and understand the challenges of each portion of your team. So your legal team may not understand what some of the challenges are with your financial team. Your operations team may not understand some of the limitations that they have from a business and financial perspective. Um, and I'm the person that's able to integrate those things. Uh, I literally uh, just got a call about, um, I was approached about being a CEO of a company uh, because of my expertise, <laughs> right? Those are, that's, those are the kind of conversations that I have right now. And it's because of the body of work. It's because of, of, of all the things that I bring to the table and, you know, to, these are, you only get to be in those kinds of positions if you're known for delivering. If people can trust that you can deliver, if they know that you have a uh, good judgment and, and good business acumen. Um, so it's a, it's a very, it's a very great position to be in, very great position to be in. Uh, and it allows me to be nimble, nimble. <laughs> No, you have, you just think about it like you are the sum of your total decisions, the sum makeup of your total decisions, and you going to college so early, and even to the pat the fact to where you know like the industries that you align yourself with, tech, engineering, and a asset company that can increase in value over time. It just shows how your education plays into your business development, bro. And like you have great parents and you have a great mind and you also have a great spouse because all of these things contribute to the individuals we are today. Yep, but absolutely. Absolutely. I want you to please tell the people how they can get in contact with you, if they want to get a watch, if they want to reach out to you for any speaking engagements or if they have any questions about, you know, any crypto technology and stuff, please drop socials, emails, everything, bro. Absolutely. Uh, probably the easiest way to reach me is through drjamarmontgomery.com. That's D-R-J-A-M-A-R Montgomery.com. You see it uh, scrolling at the bottom of the page. Um, I'm on social media. I'm on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Jamar Montgomery. Um, you can find me. Those are the two ones that I'm most active on. Uh, and also my YouTube of Dr. Jamar Montgomery. Those are the three best places in, in, in addition to my website uh, to get information about me. And also if you're interested in getting a watch uh, for me, getting a watch, uh, getting a J Montgomery watch. The only way that you get a J Montgomery watch is directly from me. Mm. Um, that's, that's scarcity and exclusivity and people, if they can understand like, so like right now, 
Like this, this is a turquoise arrowhead. This particular set, it was only 12 cast of these, and it has a um it has a wolf inside of it. And then I have these sets of conch piercing where I have turquoise um horseshoes on the inside of my ear. This is from an artist who did turquoise jewelry for 49 years. He just retired lab. This he just retired this one, bro. One American Indian artwork. It goes crazy in appreciation. Go just like I know a woman who sold a rug for a handmade rug for a million dollars, bro. On top of this man just retired. These are assets that I can now add because stones have appraisals. Like I have turquoise, opal, all different types of stones that have this particular value on them now. So you make purchases for the sake of the future generations because I can get these appraised when he possibly passes and because there are no more of these being made now the value goes up dramatically absolutely absolutely so for a watch company that's only want to make so many watches mm -hmm. just understand what that means mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a great model bro yep. so is there limited pieces a month uh limited pieces a year limited pieces a year mm -hmm. yeah. I'm gonna need I'm y'all gonna get y'all money right because I'm gonna take somebody's spot every year, dog. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. serious, bro. Because that's one thing I will, that's one thing I will invest in. It's not necessarily jewelry, it is it's commodities that will appreciate. And this still, you know, the silver, the gold, the different tech, the ingenuity, the brand itself, those are things that. I can just put in the SKR and my children can benefit from off of the trust. Now, yeah. is there anything that you would like to leave with the people? And before we, before you say that, I would love to have you back for multiple segments for how does it work? Just so that you can come in, break down, bring some game to the people. And then we add the imagery to it. And then these create, these become reoccurring segments. But this is what I love to do in order to share my following with other people so that people can also get um, a level of community and also understanding of who people are as we develop. And like I consider you the homie and also a teammate, a business partner. So I love for people to be able to tap in with the minds that I know as well. Absolutely. Um, final thoughts. Recognize how free you are. Mm. Recognize how free you are. Your past decisions got you are got you to where you are today. The decisions you make today will get you to where you want to be tomorrow. Do real hard thinking on where you want to be tomorrow and do everything, everything, everything that's going to get you there and do nothing that won't. I hope y'all paid attention to that, bro. That was that was profound on so many levels. And with that being said, this has been another great episode. And we thank you for joining us tonight. You as a viewer, also as our guest speaker, Dr. Jamar Montgomery, Mr. Two Watches. So make sure y'all tap in and oh y'all like, subscribe. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.